Having worked through what climographs are and tied to talking about climate, we're also going to build on that and introduce in this lecture some water balance diagrams, which will help us build into talking about biomes. And so for uh, talking about the issue of water balance, to get us in the mood for that, we have actually a pair of songs that kind of play off each other for to get us ready for this video. So No Rain by Blind Melon or when the levee breaks by Led Zeppelin, kind of showing on our left-hand side, and you know, we have no rain, uh, you know, kind of on that one extreme, being very water imbalanced on the one end, and the opposite extreme once again too much water all at once on the opposite side. So we're going to be talking about kind of this influx and outflux of water, uh, and showing that over time scales, you know, especially yearly time scales, and, and tied to climate long term. You know, uh, time scales like 30 years, for example, when we've looked at climates uh, for uh, looking at these water balance diagrams as well. So again, just to remind ourselves, we've seen something like this with our climographs. Um, so again, this is showing our monthly average temperature and monthly average elevation. So the ones I showed you prior had bars for both uh, the average temperature and average monthly precipitation. Um, in both of these, but note in this case now I'm showing you the uh, this average temperature line here, and then the bars are still on precipitation, and so we have temperature nine degrees Celsius over here on the left, and for showing our precipitation over here on the right. And once again, running from January on the bottom all the way to December, so in through a typical year. And so this we have our example here for Eugene. We can see this example in kind of showing over these average conditions over 30 years, just as we've talked about with our climates, um, you know, a climate normal for a location, usually based on an average of 30 continuous years together, although that whatever exact 30 years those are can be variable. And so again, this is just showing that average of daily temperature and, and precipitation for a month here in a graphical form that makes it easy for us to interpret instead of having to look through lots and lots of data over time. And so to also kind of work in tandem with that, we will now be looking at these water balance diagrams. And so these show a balance between essentially precipitation and evaporation. So um, we're going to be talking about evaporation and potential evapotranspiration in this next slide. Essentially that is a dependent on temperature. We can think that you know when it's higher temperatures out, we're going to have a higher uh, potential evapotranspiration. So meaning both evaporation, you know, we can think of, you know, if you're out on a hot day, you know, you know water, if, you, know, you know, that's why you often times go to the pool, right? You know, cool off, that water evaporates off you a lot faster when it's warmer than when it's colder. Um, and so um, also plants uh, transpire more water when it's warmer generally. Um, and, and plants, um, especially when it gets warmer, need to be uptaking more water from soil uh, for their processes of photosynthesis and respiration. So water balance diagrams kind of show us the balance of water available to plants in the soil over a given time span. And so we'll come back to this here in a little bit. But again, just to separate this difference a little bit more clearly in terms of precipitation, evap evaporation, and potential evaporation, right? We've already, you know, when we've talked through humidity, we've talked about precipitation now. And so just noting this difference where uh, potential evapor you know, evaporation is just simply going to be that amount of actually water evaporated you know, from liquid form into water vapor form, where and the difference between that is you know when we put on that potential on, in front of those words, so a potential now evap evaporation or evapotranspiration, um, you know, that essentially saying the amount of water that could be evaporated, and that's what varies based on temperature. So it's kind of like humidity, where again we have that variable component with a potential that's based on the temperature, right? If our temperature goes up, we have a greater amount of potential evaporation. As the temperature goes down, we have a, a lower potential of evaporation in terms of the amount of water per rate of time that would be evaporated. And so the idea here is that if our potential evaporation actually you know, exceeds the amount of precipitation that's occurring, again, as we're going to be looking at over these average months of a year for any location, Right, all the water then that you know, we would get in the form of precipitation generally is also going to be evaporated or lost in some way, in that kind of way. And there's going to be a deficit of moisture because essentially the amount of water that's going to be evaporated and, and gone um, will be greater 
then the amount of water that's being added through things like precipitation. So we can see that on the right here at a global scale, essentially this difference between precipitation and evaporation. And so when we have um, you know, these value, you can look at the values here, essentially it's showing you, you know, in, in contrast, if we have precipitation minus evaporation, meaning that you know, if we have a greater precipitation value and we subtract a smaller evaporation value, we get a positive value. And so we'd be seeing more precipitation occurring in that time. And so that why if we actually look closely, for example, at the Western United States, um, really in, we get in a lot of our winter months, as it, now it's flipping through again here, we get these positive values and you know, that's where we're getting a lot more precipitation. That makes sense to us. And then oftentimes we're seeing more of these blue values in the summer or these negative values, so that meaning that evaporation is exceeding precipitation, you know, and that's why oftentimes, you know, and that makes sense to us as well, because generally our summers um, in the western United States are pretty dry. I mean, usually having much more evaporation potential than actually amount of precipitation being added in an average year. So that brings us back then to our climographs and kind of showing this visually. Um, and again, because we're interested in how this is going to play out in, in future tied to our biomes when we're going to be talking about biomes and vegetation. So um, again, these water balance diagrams showing the balance of water available to plants and soil. And you can think of it as an analogous to a glass of water. Right, and so we kind of walk through this where if we have, you know, if we kind of start with a glass of water has plant in it that's going to be growing and it's filled, you know, it has, say, let's say it's half full or half empty, depending on what kind of person you are. Um, and, you know, if you start putting more water in, then it's actually being drawn out, say, by the plant that's using that water. Of course, that water level starts to go up. And that's going to be equivalent to what we term water moisture recharge and so you know we have the capacity in that soil to hold more moisture or actually and so we're recharging it in the sense of adding more water that is being taken out by the plants um, so we can see that here um, by this green area uh, on the right over here where this usually occurs after some deficit period where again we're, we, uh, um, as we'll talk about uh, in these different types here so another example is if so if we in, keep inputting water then and we you know, get all the way to the top of that glass and we're essentially exceeding again that loss when the glass of water is full that water is, of course is going to overflow that glass and start spilling out of that glass and so the equivalent to that is this surplus and so again we're looking at Eugene here so we can think of you know it makes sense that in many of the winter months like December January February especially we're having this large surplus of moisture right you know it rains a lot in the winter in Eugene you're getting much more input of precipitation you know more than the the soil uh, can hold and so we simply are going to be having then that water run off the surface and that's why we get a lot more uh, the biggest runoff in our streams and our rivers occurring in the winter months especially uh, because a lot of that moisture you know simply doesn't have any does not going to soak into the soil and slowly go into the rivers um, and it's going to you know a lot of it's going to end up directly more in rivers and streams and such so I'm kind of now going in the reverse direction if the water loss is exceeding the amount of input then remember now if say if we were starting at that kind of full level our water levels start will start going down and that equivalent then we can think of is what we term soil moisture withdrawal and so we see this more into the early summer months uh, where, in, where now we can see you know, as shown by this color over here um, you know because our amount of potential evapotranspiration is exceeding the amount of precipitation so we have a precipitation line here a potential of transpiration line here so when that potential exceeds the amount of precipitation again those plants don't have as much moisture available to them anymore and we withdrawing what's still held in that soil for some amount until essentially it runs out and because then once our water loss actually exceeds the input until the glass runs empty um, once we get to that empty stage we can have same thing of that as an equivalent of some amount of deficit. So we see some amount of deficit that we usually get in later summer months in Eugene. We haven't had rain for quite some time. And you know, really, the plants have taken pretty much all the moisture they can get out of the soil. And the soil is pretty dry. 
when this water's been added in for some reason. And so we're kind of in some minimal deficit for, for a while here until we start getting those rains back again uh, in the later fall months. And then again, we go back into that soil moisture recharge. And so you can see this again, this is a typical pattern for Eugene, but that's going to vary depending on our type of location and those different climate types and also kind of tied to that different biome types that we'll ta be talking about. So again, this is just has connection back to these weather and climatic processes we've discussed. Remember on you know, the broad scales and types of scales that, that operates over, both in spatial, um, so again across different sizes of Earth, but also our temporal. Again, time in this case we're talking climatic type scales, um, you know, the climate normals of 30 years. And so for each climate, you know, the question is, can we understand why the climate graphs and water balance diagrams look the way they do? because of all of those climatic processes that we've discussed. Um, so things like incoming solar radiation, high and low pressure cells, you know, a lot of those different types of climatic variables, you know, humidity, all those things that we've dis discussed in, you know, early, early lectures, you know, that builds up us up to this point of being able to talk about this. And also, again, how does this affect the vegetation types and characteristics as we'll look at with biomes? And so finally, just to touch on this, I'm going to have a short separate video tied to this. Um, but eventually, for the lab, you'll be using uh, the web, some of the websites here um, to get this website that is highlighted here first here with some Google Earth data to describe water balance diagrams. Um, you'll be generating some of those water balance diagrams and looking at vegetation types. Um, and so um, note, though, just when you go to this link, and you're using it that this will only work if you are logged into the University of Oregon network. I realize some of you may be off campus. Um, some of you, even if you're within the Eugene area, may not be on campus when you're working on the lab. And so to note that if you go to this page and you're not on the UO network, it won't open for you. And so just to note that um, you'll have to actually go through Again, I'm going to have a short lecture video walking you through step by step how to do this, essentially to get onto the UO network if you are not on the UO campus. Then it starts at this uh, link here, but it has, goes through some steps. Again, look for that separate video. It'll be a short walkthrough of how to do that um, specifically for uh, you, so you can do that for the lab.